Welcome to Lunching with Books. Uh, today, our reviewer is Scott Reed, and I'm sure you don't know who he is. But uh, but anyway, he is has um, has written a book, and it's called The Top 40 Rules of Investing, and I have read it. And I was just telling Scott how much I enjoyed reading his column, and I think he uh, turns a uh, well-written phrase. So anyway, I like the way he writes, and um, I, and I enjoyed his book. Uh, Scott uh, is a graduate of Tupelo High School and Vanderbilt University, and he is a certified investment management anal analyst from IMCA through the University of Pennsylvania Wharton School of Business, and his uh, accomplishments just go on and on and on. But of course, a lot of us know that uh, uh, Scott is also a great performer. Uh, he has, uh, he's the only investment counselor probably in the United States who has uh, an Elvis impersonator, is that right? What was an Elvis Was an Elvis impersonator. He's also been a blues brother, is that correct? <laughs> It's been a while, so he is. Uh, he has. He is a man of many talents, but he has. Uh, he has a serious book. But as I told uh, some people, Scott ha has a sparkling wit, and he loves an audience. So I'm looking forward to this. <laughs> Thank you, babe. Um, yes, ma'am. Well, let's talk about that. Um, I had, uh, I was the uh, auctioneer at the library function a uh, week ago, and I did make a comment that uh, I will stand by, that I would give uh, $2 ahead for anybody that showed up at my book review for fear that it may have possibly just been Annette and David and me, and, um, <clears throat> and I will do that. I would like to clarify something uh, with we, I didn't know that we were gonna be live streaming this, and I don't know how we count those people. Uh, you count them twice. I, I'm just saying because I if there is at some point I'll the create will call me and Juanita will say you don't have any more money uh, to give to the library. So I'd like to just say that uh, I intended that to be, of course, David, for people that actually got in their car and came out here. I'm pretty excited about the fact that um, I've, uh, I've only gotten a good parking space twice for this luncheon. Uh, and the last time was when I reviewed the Arthur Ashe book. David was here. He remembered he almost had to come up and help me during part of that. And, um, and today, so uh, I, I like reviewing books. I, I, you get to park right up front. And um, normally I park over in the First United Methodist Church parking lot because I get here right when they say, I'm sorry, we're out of sandwiches, and I sit in the hallway in the back. So that's, uh, but thanks, babe, I've never, if we had smartphones, I wouldn't be here today uh, based on my actions during my Blues Brothers uh, era of my career in music. Um, they probably would have taken pictures that would have not, uh, and sent them onto the internet that would have not been very flattering, but it was a part of my life, so thanks for bringing that up, babe. <laughs> <clears throat> I've been publishing, uh, let me say this before I get started, it is, uh, it is different to, uh, um, to talk about your own book than it is to talk about someone else's, because you can read theirs and you can pick out what you like and talk about what you like, and, and um, I like everything about this book, and so uh, <laughs> it's harder for me to figure out what to talk about, because it's all enormously interesting, and... Um, and, and it'll change your life. Um, and also, I remember we have a large print copy coming out um, for people like you, Bruiser. Um, and I remember I was interviewing Jim Weatherly uh, for a function a couple of years ago, and I asked him if he if he needed to see the questions I was going to ask him in advance. And he said, "This is this about me, right?" I said, "Yeah, it's about you, Jim." He said. I'm pretty sure I got the answers to those, and so I don't need to see the questions. <laughs> and so uh, it, it, revealing your own book is a different animal. And, and my dad told me, I was telling Babe earlier, my dad told me when I was, I, I have, uh, I have fa failed at an enormous level, publicly speaking, before. 
I hope never to do that again. Um, and it was to the Lunch and Civitan Club. Of, uh, in the 30 years in this business, uh, as, as you, everybody knows, you're not really much of a prophet in your own land. And, and so I've only been asked to speak on anything regarding my business twice publicly in 30 years, and both of them were to the Lunch and Civitan Club. I was shocked by that after my first appearance, where two minutes into a 30-minute speech, I realized I was listening to one of the worst speeches I'd ever, I'd ever heard, and I was giving it, and I had 28 minutes to go. And it was pretty terrible. And so that night when I was sitting at my house, and I looked over, my dad's light was on. And, and so I went over there as I often did late at night when everybody in the, on the hills is asleep except for dad and me. And we both stayed up late. And I, I said, Dad, it's just been a terrible day. I, 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 I literally, I just, I bombed at a level I didn't think was possible. It was just horrible. I, I actually declined the pen they tried to give me afterwards because <laughs> I didn't think I'd earned it. And um, he said, uh, he said, well, I mean, you wrote everything out, right, every word. And I said, well, no, they called me yesterday and said that they had a cancellation, and could I come today? And I was supposed to talk three weeks from now, and I was going to write it, but I didn't have time, and it was just a half an hour. And he shook his head, and he said, son, it takes me three days to write five minutes of impromptu remarks. You can't ever, <laughs> don't ever go in front of a crowd without writing everything down. <clears throat> So I took his advice, and I've never done that again until today. So good luck. <laughs> good luck to you. I started in 1992, I think, 1992, I started writing for uh, publishing. Uh, my publishing career started, I think, in 1992. The reason I'm not sure is because I really thought it was a fluke, and I didn't think it would last very long, and so I didn't memorialize that in any way. I just wrote it and put it out there, and then a few years later realized that possibly I should have kept that one. Uh, it Itawama County Times called me and asked me to write a column for them, and, uh, and I agreed to write a column for them uh, once a week, I think because I'd been in the business seven years, and you may or may not remember that uh, in 1985, we opened the first full-service brokers firm in North Mississippi and at Hilliard Lines down on Front Street. Um, there wasn't one between Highway 82 and Memphis at the time. So seven years in the business, when seven years ago there were zero, there were zero people in the business, was uh, you became the senior member of a very small group, and so they asked me to write a column, and I said I would. And so after I'd written it for a few months, um, I, I got pretty cocky, and I went over to uh, the Daily Journal, and I said, yeah, I'm writing this column. I'm a published columnist, and, uh, and you could have it for the right price. And uh, they said, no, thanks. And uh, I had my first rejection letter. Uh, well, it wasn't a letter. It was actually face-to-face. Uh, -face. They said, we just don't want it. And, um, and so I did, I did continue on from there. And seven years later, if you fast forward seven years later, I got up to about 52 newspapers was the highest uh, number I got to. And, uh, and Joe Rutherford called and said, would you like to write for the journal? And I said, well, your price has gone up. I, you know, <laughs> now you're calling me. But it didn't really go up. It was really kind of pitiful. But... Um, but I did write for them for 17 years, and uh, and about 10 months ago, I went on sabbatical from writing um, from writing my column for a while. I just need a break. It's been 25 years. I need a break. It's not that I don't write interesting things. Um, I have uh, let's see. my latest my latest project since uh, not writing my column. Just so you think, I I do write fun stuff. This is a commoditization of endowment and foundation investment returns. Uh, <laughs> If anybody wants to read that, I have five copies in my briefcase. But uh, so <clears throat> my column changed in the late 90s. I'm going to give you some background on this so you can figure out why I wrote the book in the first place. In the late 1990s, my column changed mainly because, not because I wanted to become a philosopher uh, or I had something deep and meaningful to say. It really happened because John already is here, my business partner, for 30 years now, 30 years together. It's like a marriage. Uh, still with my wife, I'm still with John. I'm still with Anita, our, our, uh, our executive assistant. If any of those three things change, I'm screwed. But, um, so, but they're all still here with me. Um, and we were under five different compliance offices. We were, uh, we, we were under our own internal compliance. We were a member of the New York Stock Exchange, so we were under the New York Stock Exchange Compliance Office. We were under the Securities and Exchange Commission Compliance we were under FINRA's compliance office, which back then was NASD, 
and because we had just gotten bought out by a bank, we were now under the banking uh, industry compliance. Five compliance groups had to approve every column that I wrote. They couldn't agree on anything. Um, and I will give you an example of what I had to deal with when I put a column out, because I used to talk about whether this is a good day to buy Walmart or whatever. And so I would say something like in my column, I'd say shareholders were happy to see their stock go up 20% this year. They would go, you know, probably not all shareholders were happy with that. Okay, how about most shareholders were happy to see it go up? You know, I don't think you can justify that. There's no way to prove that most shareholders were happy with that. Some shareholders? How about a few? And so the column would say, a few shareholders were happy to see Walmart stock go up 20%. That doesn't mean anything. And so really by the time I could get a column to press, it was so watered down that it didn't say anything about anything to anybody. It didn't help anybody because no one could agree on anything. And uh, they all wanted to make sure that there was nothing that, that, that someone couldn't come in and prove me wrong, that most people just weren't happy with a 20% increase in their stock. And it happened across the board in everything that I, I tried to say. And it got so hard to get a copy to press that I decided, how can I, how can I just write something that I want to say? And I thought, well, they can't argue with philosophy. That's kind of a subjective thing. If I think it's right and you think it's wrong, it's your own problem. And, and so I'll just write about philosophy. And, and so that's what I started doing. And it was a niche that no, very few people were in because it's an enormously boring thing to do and write about and read about. And so I had this little spot where I was by myself writing stuff that was so boring that nobody wanted to read it. And that was pretty exciting. And, um, and so I thought, of, how can I make this interesting to people? And, and so I decided to uh, in, incorporate, because I mean, the fact is you can't, with philosophy, you can't take what I say and go do it. You have to incorporate it in what you're already doing, right? There isn't a go do this. It's think about it when you're going to do that. Think about it this way. It's helping you make good decisions with whatever it is you're trying to do. It's not go out and buy Walmart. It's think about, if you're going to buy Walmart, think about this and this and this before you make that decision. So it's not that easy to do, and it's not that easy to explain. And, and as I looked at investment philosophy books, most of them were three, 300 pages with 200 pages of footnotes, and, and really I could hardly get through them, and I, and I really do enjoy philosophy. So I started writing using analogies and using parable-based writing to, to, to write columns about investment philosophy. So, you know, people would say, I love the one, and I love the, the, the column you wrote on this. And I thought, well, I've written three of them on that in the last two months. I don't even know, what, which, because I use different analogies. So you can, if you're, if you're a carpenter, you can figure it out because I use something about building a house. If you're a race car driver, I'll talk about great. I wrote a, a column on um, risk in the markets, and I compared it to a, to a Halloween hayride. Um, it's a stretch. I know it's a stretch, but... But, but the deal was that, that, that risk, perceived risk and real risk are different, right? And so in a, if you're on a hayride, I got this because we were actually, I take this from personal experience, we were on the First United Methodist Church hayride, and we, and we left, and we're, you know, we got eight adults and 20 kids in the back of this trailer, and we're going down the street, and all the kids are getting scared to death because we go down this line, and somebody jumps out and scares them, and they think that that's risk because they think they're going to die, which is a perceived risk, and all the parents were going, I hope that truck sees us over here. I don't, are we going to go through that red light? We shouldn't go through that red light. And so the real risk was out getting hit by a car. It wasn't the ghost and the goblins that were jumping out at us. And so perceived risk and, and real risk are completely different things. And so I try to put in a in some in some way that people could relate to, and then take that and, and apply it to their to their uh, to their investments. Um, and I try to add humor. My dad did tell me uh, one time that if you um, <clears throat> if you don't make people laugh every seven or eight minutes, uh, they're not going to pay any attention to you. It really doesn't matter how important the subject is. And, uh, and so I've tried to, and your mind does have to reset. You can listen to people for only so long before it has to reset in some form or fashion. You have to take a quick break, and then you can get back at things. And so we tried to do that. And so about the turn of the century, I love saying that because it doesn't seem that long ago, but that sounds like such an old statement. About the turn of the century, I, I wrote a novel. I wrote a financial thriller. It, it could possibly be just be a financial. Um, 
<laughs> well, you got that, Jane. Thank you for that. Um, I, I hope it's a thriller, and you may get to read it sometime, but it's at least a financial. And, uh, and I pitched it to 60 or 70 publishers, and, and um, I got some great responses. I really got Hal Phillips says the best first novel he'd ever read. That was big for me. Uh, I couldn't get a contract, but I got really great responses from people, which I heard was good because really in that business you can get really bad responses as well, and I had a couple of those. And, um, and so um, one group told me that they already had 40, the industry was consolidating. They said, we already have 40 published authors on our waiting list, and it really doesn't matter how good, nobody's looking for an unpublished author. And, uh, and so I put it on the shelf and, and tried to forget about it. And then my brother, Jack, who's here today, asked me a, a, few, a couple of years ago, he said, what did you ever do with that? And I said, nothing, that's on the shelf. And he said, well, you should try again to, to get that published. And so I was at a book signing with, uh, for Chancellor Kayat, and Neil White was there, and I asked him if he would read the book and give me some advice. I didn't ask him to publish it. And his publishing house is really about other things. And he said he'd be glad to, so he did. And we met Annette, and I met with Neil at the City Grocery in Oxford for lunch to talk, to talk about the book. And he said, I think the book has merit, and I think it ought to be published, and I'll help you do that if you'll do one thing for me first. And I said, sure, I'll, I'll buy a lunch. He said, no, I want you to write a book about investment philosophy. I said, well, that's harder than buying lunch. Uh, and I really didn't have that on my radar screen. But, uh, um, and so we talked about it, and he wanted a book on investment philosophy it was a lot like the columns that I've been writing and a lot less like uh, some classroom um, lecture. And so we talked and we talked and talked about it. And really this, this book, which is, which is uh, short and, uh, um, and, and, it, and, it, and small, was, was that way by intention. And, and so we wanted investment philosophy, we wanted short chapters, and we wanted there to be some humor involved in it. And, um, and, and so he wanted it to be somewhere around 700 words a chapter. And, and I thought about my contracts I currently had for columns, and they were all at 600 words. And I said, well, what do you think about 600-word chapters? And he said, because I can write a 600-word column in, in, you know, easily now. And he said, yeah, that, that would work. And so then I said, okay, let's try that. And we got the format for it. I like Casey Kasem's Top 40 when I was growing up. I love listening to that every week. Also, like, if you look at NCIS, the, the, the show every week, they, they've got uh, Jethro Gibbs, the lead character played by Mark Harmon, has these rules that come out of nowhere, and everybody goes, Rule 12, and everybody goes, <laughs> yeah. So I, kinda, I love the idea of having rules to live by, and so I just put the two together. I originally, Neil wanted 50 rules, and I couldn't come up with 50 good rules, and so I said, how about 40, top 40, and use the, the NCIS rules for the – book so that's what we did and so I started writing it and I immediately called Lloyd Gray and said Lloyd I, I got an idea and I had three contracts for columns at the time and I was writing those and I, and I couldn't figure out how I was going to get a book written in the time that he wanted me to unless uh, they became columns and I said how about this how about we double my pay we double the amount of columns I write for the journal and I'll write my book in columns in the journal and I'll send them in and there will be a chapter and I send it in will be a chapter and he said We'll do that. And, uh, and so that's how I got the book written. You can actually go back and buy the paper, each paper that has a rule in it, and <laughs> if you want to, and get the book. But honestly, the book costs less than buying uh, that many papers. And so it's a deal if you just buy the book. And it, I don't get any royalties off the papers uh, anyway, so I would encourage you to buy the book. Um, I wanted a reference guide. I'm going to tell you two mistakes in the book. I wanted a reference guide. Uh, so people could read it and they could go back and say, I'm thinking about this. What should I do about this? And I'll go back and look in the book and see what Scott said. Um, and, uh, and so I thought that would be a great idea. And, and uh, we have no table of contents in the book, so you can't actually go back and look at the table of contents. That was a mistake. And so if you will just help me sell this whole first edition, the second edition will have a table of contents in it. Uh, but we got more books to sell. They're great gifts. They're a good beet tree because they just fit right in your um, Easter, basket. Easter baskets. They fit in there. Uh, so, so that, yeah, so that's uh, the egg on the front. That's good, isn't it? Um, the other thing that I noticed, and there are more than these, I just thought this one was funny. On page 27, and my, my brother did give me some good, but he's got many more 
reviews than I have. And he said, people really don't like you reading a bunch of stuff from the book, so don't do a lot of that. I'm only going to read this one thing, Jack, only because I think it's kind of funny. It says in cha- on page 27, rule 14, halfway through the first paragraph, it says, that's a pretty hard thing to do, especially if you're counting on that money to enhance your retirement or your children's college education. You can't afford to be wrong. Rule number five mentions that fact in that it takes 10,000 hours to become an expert in any endeavor. That's rule number six. Um, so what I said, you can't afford to be wrong. Rule number five, three words after that sentence, I made a mistake. I just thought that was kind of funny for a guy who just said you can't afford to be wrong. It's kind of like I was David. I was on a, I was on a, I was guiding a river trip. A, a, still do a little bit of that, and a guy got in some trouble on the river, and I was over there trying to save him, and he was scared. <laughs> I looked at him and I said, uh, I got, I grabbed his hands. I said, I will not let you go. I will not let you go. And then I realized the only way to get him out of this position was to let him go for a second. I said, I'm gonna let you go for just a second. <laughs> talk about that in seven different chapters you're you either have to you either have to pay attention to your life or you can pay attention to your money i found that you can't do both very well um one kind of consumes the other understanding who you're working with i talk about in 14 different chapters uh, it's a big deal in our industry right now it's uh um and, and i'm not talking about who the person is you're working with you can be working with one of the greatest people in the world but you need to know what they do for a living and how they do it and how that affects what you're doing because there are, there are an enormous amount of people out there that are working with the wrong people, not because they're bad or bad at what they do, but because they don't actually do what you're looking for. We actually, John and I, one of our, uh, one of our, um, one of our big failures, and there are a bunch of those, and there are thankfully a lot more big wins, but one of our failures was John said, just speak for yourself off the page. <laughs> <laughs> Probably more, well, I noticed they, that John Adam turned the mic off. There. <laughs> we actually went into a finals presentation. We were, we were bidding on some business, a $40 million foundation, and, and uh, there were a bunch of people uh, sent back their RFPs for it. And when we found out that, uh, and so we made the final three. We thought that was great in and of itself. And then we got there, and the way that they do these dog and pony shows, they, a lot of them just put them one after the other. And we were number two in the final three. So we actually got to see number one leave, and we got to see number three as we were leaving. So we were the only people that knew everybody that was left in the race. We were really excited because we were the only people left in the race that actually did what they wanted to have done. Because a lot of people go out there and say, hey, this guy does investments, or this guy's in the investment business, let's ask them to come in. But what they wanted was someone that would actually manage the, the foundation money as a fiduciary and an advisory relationship. And they had three finalists. One was a money manager who does not do that. One was a brokerage firm that cannot do that. And the other was us. You can't be in a better position. We managed to come in third. <laughs> so when I tell you people don't really understand, and, and relationships trump, uh, trump job description in our business quite a bit. And so, and I'm going to talk about that a little later, but understanding who you're working with and what they do is important. Cost matters. Cost matters a lot. And I'll talk about that in a second as well. And that's in five different uh, uh, chapters. And then use the right part of your brain. I'm fascinated by financial uh, um, uh, behavioral science and, and investment behavioral science is fascinating to me. And uh, I can say that uh, the majority of the mistakes that are made in, in our business by clients is because of the fact that they use the wrong part of their brain to make those mistakes. And, and that fascinates me and that is actually 
uh, some reference to that is in 24 of the 40 chapters. So that's how important I think that is. If you can get that right, I think you can you can have a shot at doing this this thing in, in a good way. Um, with that, I'm going to take. I, I have done what I didn't think I would ever do, which I've taken the 40. I told you I like all of them. I did try to take the top 10 and hit on the top 10 chapter. My top 10 chapter, maybe not yours. My top 10 chapters and talk a little bit more about those and then open it up for questions if that sounds good. So, um, well, first of all, this is not part of the top 10 because it's not an investment thing. Chapter one is about um, getting friends and having a social life, having relationships. If relationships trump investments every day of the week. And if you don't have that, it really doesn't matter how much money you have. It, it, it friends trump investments. They just do. So get that right. Then number two is appears not to have anything to do with investments either. And I'm, I'm sure if you wrote read the first two chapters, you, you thought that you bought the wrong book or it was not reasonably titled. Uh, but it says get involved. Getting involved benefits everyone, and, and that's true. It's really a win-win thing. If you if you go and help the library, library has a foundation. Go and help the library. And you want to help them because the library does a great thing for the community. And you want to help. You win because you're helping. And they win because you help. But the other part about that is that when you're helping someone else, it forces you to think as a fiduciary would think. It forces you to think as someone manages somebody else's money. And when you manage somebody else's money, you don't take the risk and chances that you would normally take for yourself because everybody goes, no, I'm a smart guy. I can probably get away with this. I know there's a lot of risk, but I can handle it. We don't think about that if you're thinking about somebody else's money. If I'm, if I'm trying to manage bank's money, I'm going to say, you know, I may wing this. You may take a shot at this. You do that with your own money. And so get on the investment committee for the foundation, the library, start talking about the things that they're dealing with, and your decisions become completely different. Your mindset becomes completely different. And so, and I'm going to talk about this later on, but, but most people make emotional decisions with their amygdala, which is right here in your brain. And your, your reasonable decisions are, are here in the prefrontal cortex of your brain. So it's actually in a different location in your brain. It's not that you're getting the two mixed up. You just access the wrong part of your brain to make decisions. And so one way to train your brain to, to make good decisions is to go out and help some other people and see how, how that works. If you do it enough, you can start thinking like the person that you, you want somebody to think like when they're having when they're making decisions for you. That's rule number two. Rule number three is know who you're working with. I just talked about that a little bit. But but our business is our business is right now our business is set up with about 85% of our business, the, the professionals in our business, uh, sell a product of some kind. And their allegiance is to their firm. I can promise you that uh, John Rush is one of the best things that ever happened to Reeves. But when you go there and buy something from him, I think you're pretty sure he's trying to sell what you got at Reeves. I don't think he's ever said you should maybe go out to Belts and see what they've got. I'm sure it doesn't actually come out of his mouth. So don't need to. That's right. That's right. You can't find it reads. You don't need it. Uh, uh, that's just my personal opinion. I, uh, but but he's selling something to you. Eighty-five percent of our business sells something, and their allegiance is to the firm that they work for. Fifteen percent of our business is under a fiduciary standard and by law is required to do what's in your best interest. If you think about that, that means that most everybody you run into our business has an objective that's different from yours. As I, I say sometimes, your goals may be the same. You may both want a lake house. He wants his lake house and you want your lake house. They're different. You know, and so if he can make enough money, he'll get his lake house. If you make enough money, he'll get yours. But wait, and that's not a bad business. It's not a bad business model at all. And it's, and it's a very valid business model in our, in our industry today. And, and I'm talking Monday to the Rotary Club about the fiduciary standard and the problems with the standard. I like the standard, I like the ideas behind it, but there are unintended consequences to that that I think are, are, are significant as well. And so I'm not saying anything about that part of the business. What I'm saying is that most people don't know when they're dealing with someone who may have a, a, a a really hard time, really good people that have a hard time making a decision. So let me give you an example, and then I'll move on. Um, I use this in one of the talks that I give around the country. Uh, 
and, and so I just did the numbers on this. Take, we in our business normally get paid for about five years worth of work, somehow, for, a pro for products that we sell. So take $100,000 and say, I would like an income producing investment. I'm gonna give you $100,000. You may say, why did you pick $100,000? It's because I can do the math easier. So it's no magic in $100,000, it's easy to do math. And so I'll pick three reasonable investments. I'll pick a five-year CD. A five-year CD will pay me as a, as a commission broker of some sort. It'll pay me about $400 <coughs> to, to sell you the CD. That's what they'll pay. Or I can put you in a, in a bond fund. A regular bond fund, front and loaded bond fund, would pay me roughly over that five-year period of time about $3,000. Paid me some up front, and then it pays me 25 basis points a year in what we call trails. Or I could sell you a variable annuity. If I get the variable annuity right and put it in the right way, I can make about $12,000 over five years. All three are legitimate investments, right? All three are legitimate investments. And everybody needs those at different times. But you gotta ask yourself, how hard is it for whoever you're using to make the decision which one of those is appropriate for me when they're getting paid that much difference in commission on those three products? And so what you get paid is a critical factor and in, 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 in even for the best of us, it's a critical factor in what we recommend to you. And so I really thought in our business, <coughs> our side of the business isn't for everybody. 90% of the people out there in, in the investment world probably don't fit into Hardy Green, so I, I, this isn't a pitch for us. But on our side of the business, John and I don't get paid a dime on anything we do for anybody. That decision is really easy to make. I thought it would still be hard because you have three legitimate choices. But it's really not hard at all. If you've been in the business 30 years and you know the products and you know what somebody needs, pretty easy to pick a product that's right for somebody if you don't, if, if, the, if the amount of money I make on it doesn't get in the way. And that's the biggest, that's probably the biggest challenge in our business is there are a lot of really good people out there that are put in a position to make really tough decisions where they may have had a bad month, they've got kids in college, they've got somebody sick in their family, they need money, it's the last week of the month, they get they start at zero every month and now they're trying to pick out what's the appropriate investment for you. It's a, it's a, it's a part of the business that is enormously difficult and, and it is a great part of the business for people that wanna make their own decisions and understand that they want information being brought in from sources and they make their own decisions and, and, and they understand the commission process. But that's not really what goes on to a great extent in our business and that's one of the biggest hurdles we've got to overcome. What you invest, chapter eight, what you invest trumps how you invest. We're here to make your life a little better. We are not here to save you. We, we can't do it. In order for me to save you, I have to take a risk, uh, amount of risk that is unfathomable for you. And the only way I can do that is to lie to you about how much risk I'm taking. So if you, if you want me to make, as, as somebody said when we walked in, I said, I'm pretty sure I'm not gonna get rich overnight after I listen to you. I said, I'm pretty sure you're not either. I don't know how to do that. Uh, I, it depends on how much time you have. We can make you rich. Just give us a, enough years, 50, 60, 80, 120, something like that. But we're supposed to be the icing on the cake. We're not supposed to be the cake. And so if you're not willing to put your part in, don't expect us to save you. If you get that right and understand that, our relationship goes a lot better. Uh, find your comfort zone and stay there. That's chapter nine. And, and what I mean by that is that you get numbers from people every day in our business that say, I can get you 8% or I can get you 9% or whatever. And, and they'll say, over the last 10 years, this mutual fund did 12% a year. You should buy it and you, and you say, I can use 12% a year. Well, you don't actually get that number. You don't get that number because even if they did the same thing, if in order to get 12%, you're going up and down all the time, which means you're losing 12% or 15%, then you're making 25%. Well, if when you lose 12%, you, you get nervous and sell it, then you miss the rise back up for 20% the next time, and then it goes well again, and you go, well, I think I'll buy back, and then you buy it, then it goes down again, you sell it, and then you buy it back when it goes down because in our business, in our business, you don't buy things on sale. The only time you really want them is when they're so high, nobody in their right mind will pay for them. And if Jack put a Heart Chapter Marks uh, suit on sale for $200, y'all would tear our doors down. Of course, we would lose so much money, we wouldn't stay in business very long, but it would be a great thing. If stocks go on sale, you say, I wouldn't touch that thing. Do you see what it's doing right now? It's terrible, it's horrible. When the market went down, to, when the Dow went down to, um, to 6,000, 
uh, in the uh, 6400 in, uh, in the crash. Uh, the Q ratio, which just takes all of the actual assets in the companies that are in whatever we were looking at the S&P 500. So in the S&P 500, it just adds up all the stuff, the tables, the chairs, the cars, all of that stuff. And what's the value of those in the open market? The value in the open market is <coughs> for the Dow. Well, we're at 6,400. How can that be a bad buy? Except for nobody wanted to buy because we were at 6,400. <laughs> As, as I, a friend of mine got fired because he had the audacity to go in and want to rebalance an account for a foundation um, it, when, when they got down to you know, about 7,000 on the Dow. And they said, are you out of your mind? You want to buy stocks right now? They fired him. And right after that, the market went up about 6,000 points. And nobody wants to buy when the markets are on sale. So the deal is, if you're not comfortable with losses and in in, in gains, you can't take that risk, you're going to make mistakes because as soon as you become uncomfortable, what happens? Instead of making decisions to the front of your brain, you make decisions to the side of your brain. So the prefrontal cortex, you use the amygdala. And you screw up everything when you use the amygdala. And so if you can't handle the risk, you can't get those returns anyway. So that's a fake return for you. You can only get what you're comfortable getting. Your maximum return comes from your maximum comfort level. And that's, that's a hard thing to find. A friend of mine in the business, David Loper, once said that our industry is, is magnificent at determining the maximum amount of risk that a client can stand and then forcing them to accept it for the rest of their life. <laughs> and it doesn't have to be that way. A lot of people just don't need to take a lot of risk. If, if you put money in yourself, if you understand comfort zones and all of that stuff, you can be really content and maximize your portfolio, which isn't the same as anybody else's portfolio. It's just you. You're the only one that matters. If you can maximize your portfolio, it's all you can do. So you go to a cocktail party and somebody else says they made more than you, you think, wow, you're probably taking too much risk. That's what I would think. Instead of saying, I better do what he's doing. I had a doctor one time at a, at a function I was in uh, who explained to me for 10 minutes as we we're going through the food line at this function uh, what I should be doing with my clients. And Annette, in one of the more funny moments in our, in our life together, said, a little louder than she thought. Um, <clears throat> hey Scott, do you have any medical advice for Billy? <laughs> <laughs> and a whole everybody in the dining room broke out laughing. <laughs> Billy didn't talk to me for months, but uh, <laughs> but <laughs> fight the noise. Number twelve is fight the noise, and this is a huge deal. CNBC. Anybody watch CNBC? Yeah. CNBC uh, is, is a 24-hour day. You can watch it at 3 or 4 in the morning. right? You turn on, it's still there. On a good day, there's got to be at least 8 minutes of real news in the financial markets. But they got 24 hours to fill. And so this is what the financial news does. they got to do something. And so they fill it with accurate information about completely unimportant things. They make it sound enormously important. And then you go out and make really important decisions based on completely unimportant information. That's what happens with the news. And so we have a policy at our firm that we really shouldn't listen to the news much. And if a client calls and says, what's happening? And we had somebody ask me today, what's happening with the banks? I went, I don't know what's happening with the banks. I'll go back and look. But whatever's happening is probably not real. Um, I know we had the big downturn, not this January, but the year before. We had one of the worst starts in decades. And, and it all happened because the Chinese markets, uh, the government had been, had been artificially boosting up the Chinese economy. That, that, that news came out on December 27th, I think. And the markets tanked 10% like that. And so I called up, um, well, some of you, Hassel Franklin is a big furniture guy. He goes to China a lot. So he and dad are friends, and I've gotten to know him over the years. So I called Hassel, and I said, Hassel, how long have you known this to be happening? He said, well, at least since 02. So our markets tanked 10% in two days because of information that was 17 years old, 15 years old. I, why? Well, because they decided that it was important that day. We have, here's some, here's some uh, things that the financial news likes to say that I find interesting. They say things, it's really, it's really kind of extraordinary. They say, I've got to find it here because I didn't put these in. Here it is. The worst drop in the Dow in four days. 
Dow plummets 45 points in the last hour of trading. We trade over a billion shares a day, and it plummeted 45 points. That's 20,000 on the Dow, almost 21. Sell-off caused by investor fear that the Chinese economy is unstable, which is something we've known for decades. But we decided today it was a pretty important day to act on that. And then this is what I like. Gas prices drop. That caused a 10% decline in the market a few years ago. Rising gas prices, markets failed. That happened a couple of years ago. So you can't even decide whether to sell off because it drops or because it rises. It, it, it's got to be one or the other. It can't be both. You can't just. But the fact is that when one person starts selling, everybody else gets immersed, and then somebody else joins in, and then, and then markets go down. And we look at those as buying opportunities almost all the time instead of, instead of bad things that are happening. So fight the noise. Don't listen to the financial press. Listen to fundamentals and empirical research and those kind of things and keep your eye on the ball that you're playing with. Everyone is a business owner. This may be, I told Annette, this may be my next book, Everyone is a Business Owner, because you are business owners. Every, everyone in the world, or at least everyone in the United States of America, at some time plans to retire. And when you retire, you have only one employee. That is yourself, and you're paying yourself a salary. And so you got to treat your investments as if they're a business. And at the end of the day, your business <coughs> has to have assets that can handle the one employee that's left when you retire, or two, or four. In my case, it may be four when I retire. <laughs> <laughs> Daughters, not, they want to go out. They just want to send me their bills. But, uh, they do want to get out of the house, not that. They want their own house. They need to pay for it. But uh, it's another story. Uh, but at the end of the day, you are your own business. And you are your own employee at, 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 at when you retire. And so you've got to think about it that way. So it's not, it's not well, it'll all work out. Well, it may, it may or may not work out. The businesses fail and rise all the time. You need to be one of those businesses that rises to the occasion and actually is profitable at the end of your life. And so for that 30 or 20, you know, the fact is that you, a lot of people retire for 30 years now. By the way, you know why we're in trouble with Social Security, right? Social Security started in 1933, and, and you could start taking money out at 60 back then, and the average life expectancy was 58. So half the, more than half the people died before they ever got a penny, and that model works really well. <laughs> but everybody thinks there's some guy given right to Social Security, but you don't have to change the rules. And so now the average life expectancy for a woman is 88, for a man is about 82 or 3, and that's starting from birth. By the time we get our age, it's a lot higher than that because we've already had all the, all the folks that, you know, motorcycle wrecks and all that stuff that get a lot of people out of, out of, out of the pool already happened so your life expectancy is pretty high but now we've changed that you, you can't start taking it at 60 anymore it's just not it's not reasonable we're going to start at 62. life expectancy has gone from 58 to 88 and our time that we can that we can start taking social security has gone from 60 to 62. does anybody see a problem with that model <laughs> The reason we don't change is because nobody thinks they can get reelected if they actually, actually tell you the truth. I'm not running for office, so I get to tell you the truth. But the fact is that, that people that are in our age, looking at the crowd out here, most of us won't have much of a problem with that because they're, that, that, uh, anybody that suggested they take it away from us is gonna get shot by somebody, so they're not gonna have that happen. But we need to figure out the next generation and, and figure out how to save them. It's not gonna be around. Um, everyone's a business owner. Cost always matters. I did this for a, for a foundation that we were working with the other day, so I'll give you this, uh, well, actually not the other day, it's been about a year now. Um, but we were looking at the cost of the foundation, the cost of the foundation, they were paying, it was a $90 million foundation, they are paying about 1% in investment expenses in their underlying portfolio. And, um, and so I just, I just put this together to see where they, what would have happened if they had saved, uh, if they, it, it, if their expenses had gone from 1% to 75 basis, basis point is 1 one hundred percent So 75 basis points is three quarters of a percent. Or if it went to half a percent or if it went to 25 basis points. 
there are a lot of investments out there that you can get for 25 basis points. Anybody want to guess over a 30 year period of time at a 6% annualized rate of return, how much more money that foundation would have if they could get their expenses from 1% to 25 basis points on their internal fees? Anybody want to guess? Somebody guess. David, guess. Marshall, what do you think? Oh. 30, 30 times. 30 times. 30 times what? 30 times what they would have got if they if they did. Well, well they would have got a number. You can tell me what they Oh, it's too, I'll just tell you. I'll just tell you. <laughs> I didn't want to guess. I, I know, I appreciate it. Jack, you're exactly what you're counting on. I'm sorry for you. I appreciate it. Yeah. Well, yeah. well, yeah. yeah. well, yeah. well, yeah. What's a big number? It's like Johnny Carson asked Ed McMahon one time, said, how many edible fish do you think there are in the world? Ed said, 35,000. <laughs> No, it's still like 800. <laughs> That's kind of how I feel sometimes. But, um, it's a $90 million portfolio over 30 years if they can cut their expenses from 1% to 25 basis points would give them an extra $92 million. Investments are all the same. Return is the same. All they did was, was cut their expenses. So if you don't think expenses matter, expenses matter a lot. And over a period of time, compounding rate of returns, you know, one of my chapters is that uh, interest is a weapon. It is, and it can be shot at you or it can be shot by you. So you can either use it to your advantage or you can, it'll be used against you. But compound rate of return is a pretty big thing. And over a, life, a lifetime, it matters a lot. It's never too good to pass up. People come to me all the time and say, I have to do this. I'll never see another deal like this again. And John and I see about 10 of those deals a week. Um, and so I will just say to you, when you think, that a deal is too good to pass up, I will say these words. Bernie Madoff, <laughs> WorldCom, Enron, Stanford. I was there the day they locked the doors on Stanford. It was, uh, I wasn't there, because I wasn't there. I was across the street, my place. Well, they did not lock the door. Uh, but the fact is that, that, that we see deals that are too good to pass up every day. You can't see them every day if they're too good to pass up. So just wait around for one that makes sense for you. Don't get lured in. And of course, what happens when they start talking about, you know, when they start talking about, you know, we're going to quadruple your money in the next two years, and you go, wow, that's incredible. And immediately, your mind goes from here to here, right? You just, here's your brain just starts going straight over to the other side, and you start making bad decisions. Past performance, have y'all ever heard this? Past performance can be indicative uh, uh, past performance would, will, is not indicative of future performance. You've seen that. It's a lie. It's a lie that compliance people make you put it on there. Past performance is indicative of future performance. If you find an investment that's going up a lot, it's about to go down. And if you find one that's going down, it's about to go up. That's how it works. It's not the other way around. Good investments go down, bad investments go up. In general, we're a reversion to the mean business. Stocks over the last 100 years, 9% return. Bonds, what, John, 7% or so. Uh, maybe a little less than that now the last few years. Mm -hmm. um, that's where they're gonna be. And so if your investment's making 15%, you can rest assured it's gonna make something a lot worse than that pretty soon. Or you're gonna be taking so much risk that you, that you don't understand that you don't need to be in the first place. Reversion to the mean business. And so what you're really trying to do is you're trying to do a little better than average if you're lucky. And then let the, let the numbers work for you. The markets are up 70% of the time. They're down 30% of the time. Somebody said, well, what do you think we're gonna have a 10% correction in the market? I said, yeah, we have one every 18 months. On average, we have a 10% correction every 18 months. And we, every time, we act like it's the biggest doggone thing that ever happened. But it's gonna happen again just after your next birthday. And so, and so those things don't bother me. What bothers me is trying to get more than you deserve. You don't get more than you deserve out of the market. You get the market and you get risk pays off. And so getting the, your risk right and getting your return scenario right and then being satisfied with that is the key to long-term uh, success, I think. And then the other is sometimes it's just not your fault. And that's the biggest one to me because that's the one, the whole idea about what part of your brain do you use to make decisions. And most people use the emotional side of the brain. And we are very good at trying to access the emotional side of your brain. I mean, we, there, there are ads out there. Um, and th and this, is, this is another thing I'll say about our industry and why it's so hard to figure out what people are doing. 
in general, um, nobody that sells a product wants anybody to know they're selling a product. If you stay on the green line, you, um, if you stay on the green, let's see, I said something bad, John's leaving. <laughs> or hopefully he's going to stay quiet. <laughs> That'd be good. If you stay on the green line, everything will be okay. If you, if, I don't know, <coughs> Lee Jones was a U.S. Marshal in two movies, and he said that if you just stay with his company, everything's going to be good, and U.S. Marshals don't lie to you, right? Sam Waterston was an assistant district attorney in New York for 10 seasons, and, uh, and he would never lie to you. And he says his company is going to do anything you want. Edward Jones says, says uh, we're, we're just here for you, and they, and they start to, it's time for me to give back to daddy. I love that commercial. I want to play it for my kids, but, I, but, <laughs> but that's not really what it's about. At the end of the day, they're still selling products, and so it's really hard, and they want you to believe, everybody wants you to believe that, that, uh, that they can do something for you that nobody else can, and when they get you to believe that, you access the wrong part of your brain, and you start making bad decisions. And so really, just understanding the fact that most of the decisions you're gonna to wanna to make, you're gonna to wanna to make with the wrong part of your brain. If you understand that, and you can sit back and say, okay, what, what really is important in this decision-making process for me? What really is important? I mean, the fact is that if, almost everybody I know builds a portfolio from the bottom up. They go out and they find stocks they like, or bonds they like, or a mutual fund they like, and they buy it, and then they buy another one, then they buy another one. Then they buy another one, and all of a sudden they have a portfolio. And the portfolio doesn't make any sense to them because they started with the individual investments. Instead of starting and saying, what do I need? What does that look like? What kind of portfolio am I trying to, what am I trying to accomplish with my portfolio? And by the way, oh, I need this amount of this and this amount of this. I don't need four of these. I went into uh, to a retirement plan, did an analysis of it one time, had 21 investment options. And they felt like they were, I mean, they felt good. They were diversified. 17 of their investment options were large cap value mutual funds. 17 of them. You only need one. But they thought they were diversified, even though 17 out of their 21 investments were doing exactly the same thing. But when you start with a fund, and you say, oh, I like that one, and that one over the last five years did this. Well, that's great. But if you don't need it, you don't need it. And so it really doesn't matter what it does if it's not something you need. And so, and so understanding the fact that you need to access the prefrontal cortex of your brain when you're making decisions, and that most of the time everybody's trying to talk you out of using it, will make you step back for a second and say, what do I need to do to make good decisions on my investment portfolio? So those are my top 10 uh, from the book. It's probably more fun to read the book than it is to listen to me. Uh, 600 word chapters, you can read them in about five minutes. Annette calls it the uh, Paul Harvey, uh, Paul Harvey <coughs> story version of investment philosophy. You can read a chapter in five minutes. It has some humor in it and, uh, and a story involved in it. And so that's the book. And and right and oh, good. I've got time for five minutes worth of questions. David, I'd like to know you, you've got a gift, Scott, in writing. Uh, when are you going to go back online and start uh, writing and publishing in your college? I don't know. I, 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 I was surprised that I enjoyed the break so much. Uh, it just, it, it is, um, it, it, it's, it's pain, writing is painful and um, it, uh, it takes a lot of thought. And it, it doesn't take me long to write a comedy anymore, but, but I write the first paragraph and a half or two paragraphs in my head during the week. And that takes a lot of thought and process. No, I sit down and write the rest of it, it comes out pretty quickly. But um, I don't know, it, uh, our business is, um, we're the, now the fourth uh, largest uh, registered investment advisory firm in the state, uh, uh, over uh, Malthus and Trustmark and uh, one other group. Uh, and so uh, we're we're in 24 states and two countries right now. We're moving pretty fast, and, and I need to spend some time there. So I'm trying to figure out how to balance those two. But uh, um, but I would write I would write again for the journal if we could come up with a contract that makes sense to me. So if you like them, if you like them, say say something to. Uh, Play and tell me you'd like to have me back. Uh, I would probably do that again. But uh, I'm writing some white papers and some other things that uh, for the industry um, that, that uh, have been fairly successful. And I do a lot of speaking these days. Uh, the fiduciary debate in Washington is a big deal, and uh, we were early adapters to that. So we're we're kind of the old men in the in the group. And so when they looked around and, and needed people to speak for some things about ten years ago. He 
they started asking me, and I was feeling really pretty doggone uh, impressed with myself. Uh, once uh, early on, I, I, Annette went with me. She only goes to places where they put me up in, in really nice hotels. Uh, <laughs> and uh, and we were in San Antonio, and I gave a talk, and I was at the airport. Some guy recognized me, came up, and just said, uh, and and I, and I was just beaming. And, and Annette said. Uh, I wouldn't get too excited about that. The bar is so enormously low in your field that uh, it's not hard to be a rock star. Uh, it is a really boring part of the business, talking about fiduciary uh, best practices and some pretty boring stuff. But I have done a lot of that, so you can next week in Chicago and, and around. So it's just a, it's a balance thing. I ain't quite got that. Hope you'll do it. Thank you. Anybody else? So yes, ma'am. Would you ask your strike list when you went in for consultation to talk about whether that person is acting as your so the, the, the biggest the biggest question you have to answer is how do you want the relationship to go and and, and and the big picture if you want to step away from what you're doing and have somebody else do it for you and you don't want to be actively involved then the only way I know to do that with some safety is to have someone that's a fiduciary do that for you and with you because they have a they have a legal obligation by law to do what's in your best interest. If you're not going to pay attention to it, you got to have somebody that, that's got some responsibility and liability for doing the right thing. And so I would say yes. But if you want to, if you want to be the manager of all of those things for yourself, then probably you don't need a fiduciary. You need a broker. You need an insurance. You need somebody that has a bunch of products and they're going to tell you about them, and you get to make your own decisions. But then they're not responsible for that. And on the suitability side, there's a fiduciary side, a suitability side. On the suitability side, the standard of care is that I have to know what it is you need. And when I sell you, I have to know that you have the financial wherewithal to stand whatever happens to you. That's the hurdle. And I don't have to keep up with those investments. Because on the brokerage side, we had, we, we were, uh, John and I were on the front page of Register Rep Magazine in 1991 or two really wasn't something we told our clients about because the title was these guys fired 3,000 of their clients um, I know it's not a really attractive article but um, but on that side of it you, you can what we call fade and trade you can, uh, trade and fade you can you can trade and move on to the next thing and trade and move on to the next thing uh, David calls me I say yeah let's do this and he says great and I do it and then I'm, I'm right on the bait and then I'm over to, to Amanda and then I'm you know and and, and, and then all of a sudden you can do a lot of that if you don't have to keep up with what you did. And so John and I realized that we had so many clients we couldn't do anything proactive for them. We were just waiting for phone calls and then reacting to phone calls, and we didn't want to be that way. And so that's why we were early adapters of this model that we have now, which is managing, proactively managing assets and keeping up with them. But the only way to do that is to be a fiduciary. So I think there are a lot of people that don't need a fiduciary, but there are a lot of people that think they have one and don't. And that's probably the biggest problem in our business. What is the title of your financial <laughs> Well, the working title was Ender, uh, which is a, actually a, 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 a move that you make in a kayak. I was used to record to how kayaks a lot. No, and then, uh, and then the, uh, the title, I think, is going to be uh, Career Client. And, and it's about, uh, um, it's a, it's about a, a guy who accidentally gets in with a with a, a, a client that changes his life financially and then the, that client keeps asking to do things that are unethical and, and his in his having to deal with that and then there's death and destruction and stuff like that and then, yeah so it's a, it's there and it may come out it's something if i could ever spend the time to work on it again i think the, 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 the certainly the landscape is much better than it was back in the in early 2000s to, to sell it so we, we may we may have it out I, I, there's one bookstore it's promised me a book sign. <laughs> <laughs> it's only one I know about. <laughs> I'm not guaranteed anything else. It's all right. Uh, any, anything else? Yeah, thank you very much.